Previously on Astronomical, I attempted to recreate the Hubble Ultra Deep Field with the help of a $140,000 telescope. Now, in today's episode, I'm going to take it several steps further. I'm going to point a $700,000 telescope at a seemingly blank area of our night sky for five hours to see what it can reveal. I'm Damon Scotting, and this is Astronomical. How do you choose a patch of our night sky to create your own ultra deep field? After all, everywhere you look, the sky is filled with stars. If I want to discover something unknown, then I better find the darkest patch of sky there is. If you were to ask most space enthusiasts where the loneliest place in our universe is, they will likely bring up Booty's Void. But I felt this wasn't a good target for this video. My main justification being is that the window of opportunity to image this region is small and even at its peak, it still isn't very high above the horizon. Besides, better men and women have tried to unlock the secrets of the great nothing and failed. To try and give a sense of scale, allow me to give an arguably nonsensical example. If you densely pack together multiple copies of our Milky Way galaxy into this void leaving no spare room, then you could fit in precisely eight trillion Milky Way galaxies. In 1987, scientists published their findings about the contents of Booty's Void and revealed that they had discovered a grand total of eight galaxies within the void. Like I said, arguably a nonsensical comparison since most galaxies are far apart and their spaces in between them are vast, so we'd never expect to see that many so tightly packed together, but it's still crazy to imagine. Our universe is divided into supercluster regions, gravity brings objects of mass together. This naturally leads to voids in space, with a few rogue galaxies that are lost, adrift in what must seem to them as an endlessly dark universe. Their own island of stars is pretty much all there is. Astronomer Aldering believes that if the Milky Way had been in the center of Booty's Void, we wouldn't have known there were any other galaxies until the 1960s. So I started looking for a blank, but not too blank region of our night sky. In order to maximize the imaging capabilities of this telescope, I figured it would be best for the region to be directly overhead. That way, the amount of air and light pollution affecting our view of it would be limited, and I could also image the target throughout the night. I found a decent spot in our night sky, and these are its exact coordinates. I cross-referenced our most up-to-date and detailed records of what belongs to this region of space. A few deep sky objects, but mostly unidentified. I then typed in my coordinates and waited for the telescope to take the images. Was I about to discover something brand new? So now it's time to see exactly what the $700,000 telescope captured after I pointed it at pretty much nothing for five hours. This is the region I've imaged, and these are three of the most extensive and up-to-date catalogues of objects in our night skies. They cover stars, galaxies, nebula, minor planets, quasars, asteroids, practically everything we've ever discovered is catalogued here and now displayed as either a cross, dot, or square. The digitized sky survey is one of our most comprehensive and detailed maps of the night sky, but given the time it takes to image every remote distant corner of it, the resolution and detail of these surveys can only take us so far. Until now. This is my ultra deep field overlaid. There are at least 100 faint points of light present in my image that were previously invisible from the surveys. And as for those that were visible but not yet documented, I have managed to increase the amount of detail present with my longer exposures. Despite not being catalogued, I am extremely certain that these faint patches of light here are galaxies yet to be classified. Billions of stars that we are still unable to identify. I've analysed the data surveys versus my picture in order to find any anomalies, perhaps a new star that's appeared or even one that's disappeared, but with the image I've taken not being too long after the most recent sky survey was completed, it appears nothing of note has changed. Time moves slowly on the cosmic scale. Waiting for stars to die is a lot like watching paint dry. If you slowed the paint down by a million times, that is. My biggest takeaway from this is that I need more time. I don't think I've helped discover anything new or further advance the field in any way, but I'm knocking on the door. Hubble's Ultra Deep Field was created from 11.3 days worth of long exposure images. This was created from just five hours on a ground-based telescope. If I can image this area for 50 hours, let alone 11.3 days, I'm certain I'd be able to reveal a lot more. But alas, the cost of that would almost reach the eye-watering amount 
of $2,000. But that means spending more money that I don't have. In fact, the money that funded this entire video was donated by just one amazing person. Two years ago, I set up a Patreon and enabled YouTube memberships. I created a video in which I displayed potential donors' names being destroyed in a number of diabolical cosmic ways. At the end of every episode for the soon-to-be-released Season 2 of Astronomical, those who helped support the channel would see their name obliterated. I thought this might be a better incentive as opposed to just a thank you message. But it didn't work. I raised £2, which, after YouTube takes its share, is less than £1. I had to give up on YouTube and get into the real world, as my dad likes to say at least once a week, by training to become a school teacher. But as the school year started, I received an email to say that someone had decided to join my Patreon, a man named Milos. Not only did he join the Patreon, he opted for the highest tier. Season 2 had already finished, so I couldn't add him to the credits. I sent him a message thanking him for his support, but either he hasn't seen it or he isn't interested in the plaudits, which I kind of respect to be honest. I then got stuck into teaching, forgot about YouTube for the most part, and focused on gaining my qualifications. I finished the course now, and although I haven't gone into teaching schools, I'm still doing my best to educate others on topics I am truly passionate about. This is the butthole galaxy. <laughs> But imagine my surprise when, a few weeks ago, I was donating to a fellow YouTuber's Patreon and I noticed that I still had one Patreon myself, Milos. After all this time, two whole years, he's still supporting me and the channel, even after the channel went dark for a whole year. To put it bluntly, it's thanks to him that I can make videos on topics that I love and share them with fellow enthusiasts as an example of what can be accomplished as an amateur a demonstration of all the miraculous sights and mysteries that we can explore with even our most modest setups. The discovery of new worlds, cosmic ballets, cheat codes and endless wonders of our night sky, explored from the tops of volcanoes to the bottom of back gardens, and then uploaded to YouTube. Any plain Jane can see for themselves that the vast majority of my videos rarely surpass 3,000 views, which means for the most part, I'm fortunate if I make more than £2 from them. Which is why support like this from someone like Milos is so powerful and crucial to helping maintain the future of the channel. As are the few thousand of you that watch every video, like, comment and share it with others. Astronomy is admittedly a niche hobby, even more so when it comes to imaging our night sky. But just because our community is small doesn't mean it doesn't interest other people. I've spent the last year listening to kids cry about how boring biology, chemistry and physics are, but never once has any of them referred to space as being boring. Never once has someone said that looking at stars and talking about distant worlds doesn't interest them. That a comet in our solar system seemingly zipping past a colossal cloud of dust and gas that looks like a fire-breathing dragon isn't the coolest sh** you've ever seen. Even more so due to the fact that we can see it all for ourselves. The biggest problem is that there isn't enough information out there for them to learn more about these cosmic wonders for themselves. I originally referred to this image in my previous video as my own ultra deep field, but perhaps that was incredibly selfish of me. Because if it wasn't for Milos's donations, then it simply wouldn't have been possible. It would have been another idea on a practically endless list of video ideas that I'm hoping to pursue in the future, but money ultimately restricts me from doing so. So, if you enjoyed this video and would like to continue seeing me explore more wonders and attempt new cosmic challenges, then please make sure to like, subscribe, and most importantly, thank Milos. Thank Manish, thank Zigazig, thank Michael, thank the anonymous person who bought me a coffee two months ago, thank all the people who have used Super Thanks to support me, because thanks to them, I'm still standing. I'm still doing something that I really love. We can all agree that that right there is special, and it's completely free. This doesn't cost you a penny. Anyone can step outside and appreciate the beauty of the nice guy. If you'd like to help support the channel, then links to the channel membership, Patreon, and Buy Me a Coffee are also below. Thanks for watching. I'm Damon Scotting, and this was Astronomical. <laughs>